What secret techniques helped Pixar to evolve from this animation level to this? Let's find out! Of Monsters and Men As the latest Pixar film The Lighting Audiences, Luca also boasts some new technology that the animation giant has never done before. What, you may ask? The ability to turn sea creatures into humans! It might sound like something simple to do, but it isn't, if you want to make the transition look as smooth and authentic as possible, especially considering Luca's style. The Pixar team built special technology from the ground up, using real-world examples as influence. Basically, they looked at chameleons and other creatures that are able to alter their appearances. By taking a look at nature, the animators found a way to blend what actually happens with the other artworks applied for Luca, including paintings, photographs, puppets, and even stop-motion. Sheesh, and most people think that people just spend all day drawing whatever comes to mind. This sounds like an awful lot of work, but hey, it paid off, so you can't dispute the method. Lights, virtual camera, action! You'd think that a film being animated would remove the need for a cameraman or director of photography to be present. After all, you can just draw or animate what you need in the scene. But that's the wrong answer. Wrong, 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 wrong! In fact, for Pixar DP Patrick Lynn, you need to follow the same principles of cinematography, no matter what type of film you're creating. This is why he used virtual camera and lens choices to mimic real-life effects on film, such as Toy Story 4, which actually felt like it could have been shot in real life. Also, a feature like Inside Out showcased the use of handheld camera movements, bringing the audience right into the intimacy of the scenes. It's incredible to think that so much thought went into every single shot of these films, while still ensuring that character-first storytelling remained the central focus. But you know what else is impressive? Be prepared to get a little hairy around here. So fur, so good! Practice makes perfect, right? Well, Pixar has had more than a few years and movies to perfect the art of both animation and storytelling. In this time, the studio has learned how to make its characters and creatures look incredibly realistic. Back when Toy Story dropped in 95, Scud the dog was impressive to stare at. Not only was it a design that made everything else before it look inferior, but it also signaled a new standard and landmark in animation. Yet, there was something missing to truly bridge the gap between animation and realism, the fur. Thankfully, technology evolved, allowing for better and more realistic designs. So, if you look at Scud from the first Toy Story and compare compare him to the cat from Toy Story 4, it's like night and day. Turns out, it's a fur scientist's job. Yes, that's a real thing. To work with the animation team to get realistic-looking fur for creatures. <laughs> Sully from Monsters, Inc. as an example has a million strands of fur. So, the Pixar animation team uses simulation programs, taking into account force, velocity, and acceleration to understand how the hair particles move. Then, using simple algebra equations, the team applies it to the character's hair. And voila! <laughs> Sheesh, who knew that maths would come in handy for creating animated movies? Research, research, research. While Pixar's main ethos is all about creativity, its team understands the importance of research to all its projects. In fact, the filmmakers spend almost as much time preparing for the feature, if not more, as they do creating it. Its various exhibitions at Cooper Hewitt in New York are testament to this because no detail is left unturned in a Pixar movie. Look at Up as an example. Carl's house is absolutely pivotal to the story, so a lot of time was spent planning and even designing this house, right down to the cracks on the wall. Based on a Victorian-style home in Berkeley, California, the designers got into the nitty-gritty of it all, analyzing the copper at the base of the chimney to even the frequency of the paint cracks. Speaking about the insane amount of detail, Carrie McCarty, a curatorial director at Cooper Hewitt, said, when the house floats up and you're looking at the infrastructure, it was really important that pipes connect in the right way. So if a plumber was watching the film, they wouldn't go, oh, they took a lot of license. Kara says that Pixar has perfected the art of perfecting realism while still convincing people to go along with the fantastical nature of the story. But once the research is done, the real hard work begins, like recreating actual tendons and muscles for the characters. And we'll be covering that later, so stick around. 
not reinventing the wheel. You might think that Pixar is always looking for ways to change the landscape at every opportunity and to better itself, but it also understands when something doesn't need to be reinvented. Being a genius certainly has its advantages. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to trust what's working and not mess with a winning formula. In fact, there have been a few times when Pixar has used ideas from previous films and other features to glorious effect. Like in Coco, especially in the case of Miguel's dog, Dante. As you may recall, the dog's tongue hangs out and has a mind of its own. To show this in the movie, the animators borrowed the rig from Finding Dory that was used to create Hank's tentacles. So instead of redoing everything from scratch to get Dante's wild tongue, the template was already there for the animators to adapt and use for their own purposes here. Funny enough, it could have been the other way around since Coco had actually taken six years to make, so Finding Dory might have been the one borrowing from it. Good thing that the filmmakers took their sweet time with the movie then, right? But are there any other examples you can think of where Pixar has used elements from other movies and its newer features? Let us know in the comments. It's all muscle memory. Remember when Mr. Incredible flexed and moved around like the superhero he was? Well, that was thanks to some full-body reference footage, as well as some innovative technology at the time. The team wasn't just working with a rigid skeleton. but a layer of muscles that could bulge and flex. For this, Pixar created a system called Goo, which allowed the animators to see the skin and muscles react as they worked in complete real time. And you know what this meant, right? Better flexibility, movement, and actual control over how the character moved on screen. This revolutionary technology was particularly useful for the more challenging body parts like shoulders and the such, something that hadn't been possible in earlier films. And now you can see it in full swing in all of the recent Pixar movies. Heck, just look at the most recent Incredibles film, and you can see how it has matured in leaps and bounds. But if you're fascinated by this technological marvel, then you better put a helmet on, because your mind is about to be blown by the next incredible detail. <laughs> Capturing the soul of music. Much like its name, soul has a lot of soul in it. It possesses so much music goodness, and it's mind-blowing to think these are digital creations playing instruments in actually the right way. So how was this made possible? Well, let's break down Joe's piano skills. First off, Pixar captured musician John Batiste playing the piano from multiple angles as reference. However, this wasn't the only thing the animation studio did, as it actually built a piano rig that functions like a digital piano. Basically, the audio file would be fed into the digital piano, and it would play by itself in time with the music. So if one of the keys lit up blue, the animators knew they needed to place Joe's left hand there. If it was red, his right hand. You get the picture. But here's the thing. They actually took the heaviness and contortion of his hands, as well as the interaction with the keys into consideration here. The team equipped 292 controls into each hand, adding variables never used before in their animated movies. They even added a control for each tendon in his hand. Talk about being thorough. Basically, they created a digital musician who plays in key, on time, and even strains his hand like a real one. It makes us raise our eyebrows in total amazement. And speaking of which, the importance of eyebrows? You know how people say the eyes are the window to the soul? Well, it's true, but eyebrows are the way you can tell what someone is feeling and if you should approach them or not. Those little caterpillar-looking things above our eyelids actually convey a lot of emotion. Seriously, just ask The Rock. And Pixar's animators figured this out as well, which is one of the reasons you notice a lot more eyebrow movements in the movies nowadays. Take Finding Nemo as an example. In case you haven't noticed, fish don't have eyebrows, and the animators weren't intent on including them and freaking out biology teachers in the process. Honestly, can you imagine a fish with a furry brow? So Pixar figured out a way around it, using reference footage and adding eyebrow-like lumps to the faces of characters like Marlin and Dory. Then they connected these movements to other parts of their faces. So if someone winks, their mouth also moves, and so on. This created a lot more relatable emotions and helped the audience identify more with the characters on screen. It definitely made the film more engaging in the process, instead of you having to figure out what a fish was thinking if it looked like this. Feeling excited? But wait, we have more! 
Check out this video that uncovers all the CGI and visual effects of Marvel's WandaVision. And while you're watching, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching, and stay awesome!